Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Today I'm so excited to be continuing my game collection update series. A series I started earlier this year and I've already done my game collection updates for the Nintendo 3DS and today I'm going to be doing it for the Nintendo DS. Now I think it's important to kind of preface before we get too deep in the video that this is not a normal game collection updates video that you might be familiar with on YouTube where people kind of thumb through their collection, show each game, maybe share a couple thoughts or stories about each game and move on to the next. It's a little bit different in the sense that I'm actually going to be updating my game collection in real time using a site called Backloggery. Now, if you're not familiar with Backloggery, it's a super simple free to use site where you can catalog your game collection. It's kind of a manual effort, so it's a little bit different than maybe some of the uh, other applications that are out there where you can kind of update your game collection. It's pulling from a database and things like that, but I've loved it for so many years. I've been using it since really since I got started, you know, making videos on YouTube. It's really fun for me. And I thought, you know, the past couple of years, I've really gotten out of the habit of leveraging that site and I've kind of amassed or, you know, built my collection uh, from my YouTube days into my adult life. And so I thought, Maybe it'll be fun to update this in real time here on YouTube. Gives me an opportunity to kind of share the state of my game collection, how I've really kind of whittled down certain collections to be kind of the rusty essentials, if you will, the Ari Lewis 2011 essentials, and also kind of, you know, a call out to all of you that, hey, are there any games, are there any hidden gems or standout titles for a particular console that you think I should add to my collection? So it's a two-way street here. I get to share the state of my game collection with you. Hopefully you find a few standout titles that you might want to add to your collection, but it's a call out to all of you to drop a comment below. Let me know what are some of your favorite games for this system? Are there any notable omissions in my collection based on the system that I'm talking about with each subsequent video? And overall, just a chance to reminisce and share our love and thoughts about the game console that I'm talking about that for that particular episode. So Get cozy. This is meant to be a video series that's super chill, kind of laid back. I'm going to really take my time with this. And I'm thrilled to be doing the Nintendo DS today because it was a system that I retreated to in college a lot. And I feel like over the past several years, I've kind of truly whittled my collection down to what I would consider the greatest hits of the console uh, for me specifically, right? So uh, that's what a game collection is meant to be. It's supposed to be special to you and all the games you own are meant to be meaningful uh, to you as well. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be long. So get cozy, kick your feet up. Hopefully you're drinking a nice good beverage. I um I think it's only fitting that I've been drinking coffee out of my Dragon Quest mug because um, mm, it's good coffee. We all know there are many great Dragon Quest games on the Nintendo DS. So kick your feet up. Let's check out my Nintendo DS collection. All right, before we go deep into the game collection itself, I think it's important to share at least some initial memories with the system. First time I held it, first kind of bundle of games I got to play on the DS. I, I don't know, I just think it's fun to hear people's first memories playing a particular console. And so for me, I have to take you back to sixth grade I remember like it was yesterday, my buddy Donald had just gotten the PSP. And it was like that classic scene in Toy Story where Andy gets Buzz Lightyear and he kind of throws Woody to the side and he's just like, I don't want to play with you anymore, right? Because he has this fancy, shiny new toy and Buzz and my buddy Donald had the PSP. So you can't blame him, right? I mean, the PSP at the time was like a portable PS2 and graphically, um, power-wise looked, you know, light years ahead no pun intended of the nintendo ds and so that was my opportunity to kind of swoop in and say hey if you're getting rid of that like i'm your guy and i remember his mom was very strict about it like hey like we just got you the ds you know whatever it was a couple of months maybe a year prior you're already kind of shoveling it aside for the psp rusty's gonna need to pay you like basically retail for the system because it also came with it was the original DS Fat with Super Mario 64 DS, Ridge Racer DS, Asphalt DS, and I feel like maybe one or two other games. 
those are the ones that I kind of remember vividly. And so I think I gave him about 80, $100 cash and like a stack of my personal games, PS2 and GameCube, I think. So we kind of kept going back and forth and negotiating what that stack would be. I don't think I got any rid of anything significant. Um, you know, on the GameCube, it wasn't like I was giving him stuff like Metroid Prime, Super Mario Sunshine. It was like Midway Arcade Treasures and stuff like that. And I think on PS2, I gave him Ratchet and Clank Going Commando, NBA Street 2, and a couple other games. So nothing too crazy. But I remember getting that console, taking it home, a little jealous, of course, because I remember him being in my house one day playing Need for Speed Underground on the PSP, and I'm like, mind-boggling how good that looked back then uh, while I'm over here playing Asphalt DS on, on the DS. Um, definitely can't compare graphically, but I still had a heck of a fun time playing that little handheld. And flash forward, you know, a, a couple years, I eventually got the red DS Lite, and eventually, of course, I got the Midnight Blue DS XL that I kind of got a lot of traffic uh, on my YouTube page because I unboxed it like the day it actually released. Uh, unfortunately, I no longer have the Midnight Blue DS XL, but I do have that red DS Lite in addition to that teal blue DS Fat. That's, that's actually my wife's original. Yeah, so I'm glad that I still have those two in the collection. And it was around that time that I got the Red DS Lite that I was looking on YouTube, trying to get recommendations, finding people like Steph's Too Deaf with her Dragon Ball Origins video. Uh, of course, TV and Lust, one of the um, craziest DS collections that I've ever seen. Big DS collector back then, and he still is to this day. Pete Dore, a number of other folks when I was kind of getting recommendations for the DS. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my earliest memories with the system. One other, I guess, anecdote that really sticks out to me is after getting that original DS fat, I remember going to visit my grandparents. And whenever we would do that, my mom would tend to take my sister and I to a Blockbuster Hollywood video so we could rent a Game Boy Color game or a Game Boy game. At this point, I had had the DS and so we didn't go to Blockbuster, we didn't go to Hollywood Video, we actually went to GameStop. And I remember picking up WarioWare Touched and Madden 2005. And I was inseparable from that DS. On the way up to my grandparents, any moment I got outside of talking to them, I had that thing open and was playing it. And yeah, I mean, I just loved that thing. I played it to death. And where my playtime of the DS really took off was in college. But we'll definitely get to that here in a little bit. I think it's about time that we started ripping through the actual DS games themselves. Now, as you see, we've had a change of scenery. We are on my backloggery homepage. So as you can see, for those that are not familiar and have not watched my earlier collection update series of videos, we have this now playing section. So you can actually see what games I'm playing. And again, all of this is done manually. So when you have a game in your collection that you wanna play, you actually have to click into it, add a comment. And so you can see right now, just recently started Dragon Quest Builders 2. And I've also been playing and kind of chipping away at Kirby in the Forgotten Land on the Nintendo Switch. So I'm not gonna go through my page in significant detail. You can definitely go check that out in my game collection series introduction video that I recorded earlier this year. But I think it's fun to always have this homepage up as I continue to go through my collection and update it through these videos because you can kind of see and get a taste for the types of games I'm playing now. And as you can see down here, the more recent game is for current generation consoles that I've either added or completed. But let's get right in to the Nintendo DS. And what I'm planning to do is walking through every single game that I have alphabetically and then I have all of my games up here that I'll also have a chance for you to see over there in the video as well and just talk through each one share fun stories what they mean to me and why they're still in my collection but first up we have here Castlevania Portrait of Ruin 
Now, as far as I know, there were at least three Castlevania games on the DS. Donna Sorrow, Order of Ecclesia, and Portrait of Ruin. I, at one point, had all three of those. I've since parted with most of them, and I only have Portrait of Ruin because that is my personal favorite of the three. I... I'd never really played a Castlevania game up to this point. Maybe Simon's Quest on the NES. Um, maybe one of the Castlevania games on the N64. But none of them did I ever play to completion until Portrait of Ruin. So let's see what I had to say about it. Rated 5 stars. Love this game so much. As far as I can remember, the first Castlevania game I've ever played to completion as well. Still trans stands true to this day, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I may have beaten Donna Sorrow, never beat Aura of Ecclesia. That game is hard as hell. But yeah, Castlevania Portrait of Rune is a fantastic game. Also still pretty brutal and tough. Definitely not a series for the faint of heart, at least these portable ones. But one I'd like to go back and re revisit someday because I've not gone back and replayed this one. Of course, it is a side-scrolling action Castlevania in the vein of Symphony of Night, Symphony of the Night on the PS1. Continuing that Metroidvania feel, but excellent game. I'm not sure what the price is like for this one nowadays, but definitely if you can find it and you have not played Portrait of Ruin, highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. And speaking of highly recommended DS games, a Super Nintendo classic Chrono Trigger love the cover art for that looks so good so good so clean let's see what I had to say about this one as you can see unbeaten kind of a shame to say that but still rated at five stars progress right now the faded hour I'm in the middle ages Chrono is level 41 played it for just under 20 hours let's see what I had to say I get it, truly. Like, why didn't my parents get me a Super Nintendo instead of an N64? Chrono Trigger would have changed my life. Diddy Kong Racing was good, but dang. <laughs> yeah, so I never had a Super Nintendo growing up, so I never played Chrono Trigger. And I would even say to this day, Chrono Trigger is the definitive, or the DS version, is the definitive way to experience that game. I think you can play it now on the Super Nintendo Classic and Steam and, and other avenues, but it just looks so good on the DS. It plays so well. I believe there's also some added cutscenes, and it's just a classic Super Nintendo era JRPG that still stands the test of time. No pun intended. I just feel like this is a timeless turn-based RPG with I mean, a very unique battle system. I say turn-based, but it was just... It was a lot different than that era of RPGs in your, you know, Final Fantasy 4s and Final Fantasy 3s. So, if you've not played Chrono Trigger, please do yourself a favor and do that. You, of course, have the wonderful art and character art of Akira Toriyama of Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z fame. A fantastic soundtrack. I mean, one of the most iconic JRPG soundtracks of all time. It's just really good stuff. You can't go wrong with Chrono Trigger. And it's definitely one that I need to return to and actually roll credits on because, again, haven't done that yet. So, well, next up, we come to a game alphabetically that I actually have not added to the collection. And that is Diddy Kong Racing DS. Kind of mentioned it up here, my Chrono Trigger little thoughts. My word. I, I've said it a number of times on my podcast and in conversations with others on discords, the definitive kart racer. It's better than Mario Kart 64. I will go to the grave with that mindset. It's there's just so much more to do. You have an overworld hub area where you can swap between three different uh, vehicles, even adventure mode where you actually do racing boss battles. Come on. And look at that cast of characters. They're just so stinking cute. It's just fantastic. And David Wise. Legendary soundtrack. Legendary soundtrack for Diddy Kong Racing. 
it's actually still one that I will, oh gosh. It's been a while since I've added a game while talking, so we'll get there. And I've actually not beaten the DS version I've actually never beaten it on N64. I got to the very end. The game's hella hard, especially for, for like growing up. My word. Not for the faint of heart, but a terrific time. And one of the other things I love about Diddy Kong Racing 2 is those battle modes. The one where you were in the dino park and you had to go race and get the eggs. The one where you're in the kind of Hawaiian area where everyone has three lives and you have to use the torpedoes and the mines and the other little attacks that you have in that game, the power-ups, kind of knock everyone off the map. The triple-decker ice level two. There's so much to love about Diddy Kong Racing and I wish we would have gotten a sequel. We kind of did get a spiritual successor of sorts in Banjo Pilot on the Game Boy Advance, but nothing, nothing can top. Diddy Kong Racing. So good. So we're going to stealth out that. And get back to the DS collection itself. Just really good stuff. And another one that I need to go back to and beat on the N64. But a great game to take portably. Next up, we have Dragon Ball Origins. This is, I mentioned it earlier, how I discovered Steph's Too Deaf on YouTube. I believe she did a review of this game back in the day, and I don't know if I otherwise would have heard of this game if it wasn't for her. So shout outs to you, Steph. And what a fantastic game this was. Even if you're not a fan of Dragon Ball or Dragon Ball Z, it plays very similar to the Legend of Zelda games on the DS. So Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks, where you actually use the stylus to control Goku and he runs around the map and you kind of like tap on enemies to attack them things like that and you're playing through of course the main story events of the original dragon ball anime and it's also really cool too because whenever there's a cut scene it'll display the scene across both of the ds screens as opposed to singling out one of the ds screens and you have other stuff going on the bottom or top so Really unique in that sense, and I really enjoyed this one back in the day. But let's see what I had to say on Backloggery about this one. If you're a fan of DB or DBZ, this is a must. Plays a lot like Phantom Hourglass, but with all of the Dragon Ball charm. Absolutely. Let's see what I also had to say about this. There it is. Also the game that helped me discover Steph's to Deaf on YouTube. And that's the really neat thing about Backloggery is that, yes, you can rate your games, you can flag it when you've beaten it, completed it, or if it's unplayed, but you can also add like these mini reviews. And I think it's so fascinating, especially as, you know, I eventually get to stuff like the PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, maybe the Game Boy Color is, you know, I've had my Backloggery up for 12 years and I rated certain games literally eight to 10 years ago and kind of gave my... 240 characters or less thoughts about it so as we kind of get deeper into my childhood games it'll be interesting to see what i was saying about stuff like you know the lord of the rings return of the king or enter the matrix or you know diddy kong racing being an interesting example i'm looking over my n64 shelf now dk64 golden eye stuff like that it'll be really interesting to see as time goes on but Dragon Ball Origins, I'm not sure what the price is like for this nowadays, but this is one that I'd really recommend people pick up. If you're a Dragon Ball or DBZ fan, I think it's an absolute must. Even if you're not, though, and you're looking for, you know, more top-down adventure games like The Legend of Zelda, Dragon Ball Origins is one to add to your collection. Really good stuff. And I have Dragon Ball Origins 2 here in my backloggery, but... For the life of me, I don't know where my copy is. May have lent this one to my brother-in-law. I can't quite recall, but what do we have to say about it? I think I was the only person on the planet that pre-ordered this game from Plane Trade, of all places, 
too. A funny story about this one. So when I was in eighth grade, I got a job at Kroger, which is a grocery store chain here in the Midwest. And three doors down from there was a plane trade. And so naturally, whenever I'd get my paycheck on Fridays, right after work, I'd fly down there and just check to see what they had in stock, browse the shelves. And I also really liked the owner there. He was just a super cool guy, just a gamer at heart, wasn't trying to pull one over on you or, you know, shove a bunch of unnecessary products down your throat. He always wanted to find the best games for you to take home for your personal collection. And I remember Dragon Ball Origins 2, reading about it in Nintendo Power, or at least hearing that it was going to be coming out soon. And playing trade's a little bit different, you know, they, than GameStop, where they don't necessarily have the stock coming in or ability to pre-order stuff as often, or at least that's what my memory tells me. And especially a game like Dragon Ball Origins 2. So I asked him if I could pre-order it. He didn't even know. He had to kind of go through a couple hoops, but... He pre-ordered it for me. I was the only one that pre-ordered it in the store. And uh, it was one of the very reasons that I ended up coming onto YouTube with that unboxing video, like at this point, 11 years ago or something like that. And I eventually recorded a review as well. So let's see what else I had to say about this. This game had the great pleasure of being the reason for my first YouTube video, oh, videos unboxing and review both of which i would suggest nobody watch for anything resembling quality it's just a young Ari lewis doing maybe doing his thing in all his 240p glory it's very true it's very true go check it out but again don't uh don't be holding out for anything resembling quality all right Next up, we have another game that is new to the collection, so I have to add this one. And that is Dragon Quest Heroes Rocket Slime. Now, interesting, I have not played this game, and this game was actually gifted to me by a very good friend of mine, known on the interwebs as Blink or Blinkoom. He streams on Twitch, he's on a number of great podcasts, go find him out there. But when my, my wife and I moved into our house, him and his now fiance sent us a little care package. And in that care package was Dragon Quest Heroes Rocket Slime for me and some other little goodies too. I actually did like an unboxing here on YouTube so you can go check that out. But I haven't played it. It's one of many Dragon Quest spinoff games. But let's go ahead and add that as you take a look at that box art there. The back of the box stuff. And I don't know much about this game. I've not really seen much gameplay wise. For some reason, I want to say it has like RTS elements. Could be completely wrong. If you're a fan of Dragon Quest Heroes Rocket Slime, definitely get at me in the comments. But one of very few games on the DS that I haven't played in my personal collection. We'll get into a few more here as we round out the collection. But most of my DS collection, as you can see, Beaten 16, Unfinished 4. I feel like it's one I've really been good about getting through over the years. But that's in large part due to college. But next we get into what a fantastic lineup of games here. First of which is Dragon Quest 4. Mm. And as you might be able to see, I'm not sure how the quality is for you on your end. Kind of a sun faded copy. I remember seeing this copy in a GameStop along the wall where it was getting, it was just baking day after day, week after week, month after month. And this was about the time when I started watching YouTube, hearing about the Dragon Quest series from people like Happy Console Gamer. And I thought, well, I've seen that game on the shelf for years. Seemingly, it wasn't that long. It's time for me to pick up Dragon Quest. And I just love, I love 
the artwork by Akira Toriyama, and especially when it's displayed on these little DS cases. But let's see what I had to say about Dragon Quest IV. Chapters of the Chosen. Only four stars on this one. It said credits rolled. Good stuff. Let's see if I had anything else to say. Akira Toriyama character designs, turn-based combat, quite a bit of grinding, great tunes. Sounds like Dragon Quest, plays like Dragon Quest, and I love Dragon Quest. Still true today, by the way. Still true today. Yeah, I mean, Dragon Quest, it's its comfort food for me at this point. You know, it's like going to your favorite restaurant. You never mix up your order. You always know when you're walking through those doors exactly what you're going to order. It's going to taste just like you imagine it will. And that's what the Dragon Quest series has been for decades at this point. I never expect them to reinvent the wheel, but that's why I keep going back for more because you have those turn-based battles kind of a generic story oftentimes, great tunes, and that Akira Toriyama artwork. Doesn't get much better than that. Chapters of the Chosen, um, definitely a product of its time. Quite a bit more grinding than maybe some of the later games in the series. But if you're a fan of Dragon Quest, it's a must-own. I mean, it just absolutely is. But where things get challenging and unfortunate is just how much the price of the Dragon Quest games have skyrocketed in recent years, and that's certainly true for my personal favorite Dragon Quest game in the entire series, and that's Dragon Quest V, Hand of the Heavenly Bride. Purple's my favorite color, so, I mean, come on now. Come on now with that main protagonist. So good. Let's see what I had to say about this one. Five stars. Definitely not a surprise, and we'll come back to Dragon Quest IX here in a second, don't even worry about it. Completed it in 32 hours and 35 minutes, level 42. Here we go. My personal favorite Dragon Quest game. Dragon Quest games typically are not known for telling good stories. More often than not, you play them for simplicity of their battle systems, excellent character designs, among other things. Dragon Quest V is certainly the exception to that though. The story here is actually more than enough reason to play the game and even offers some player choice at points unlike anything I had seen in other entries. Excellent game. Could not agree with my probably 18-year-old self more. There are some interesting and unique player choice decisions that you have to make in this game that somewhat change the outcome or at least direction of the story. I'll kind of leave it at that. Um, my favorite game in the Dragon Quest series you know, does what Dragon Quest IV does well, builds upon it and telling a fantastic story. And it's just such a shame that these games have gotten so expensive over the years. Some of those back of the box screenshots. So I love if there was a Switch port of sorts in a similar way to what we got um, in the, I think, Dragon Quest one through three. I'd love if they got, they came out with a collection of Dragon Quest 4 through 6 on the Switch just because it's it should not be this expensive to buy these games nowadays especially for how many copies were printed and I think I actually got Dragon Quest 5 on a second print run so holding out hope in the future that they'll do some type of a reprint or at least port these games to Switch because they're just so dang good, and more people need to be able to play them. All right, continuing the Dragon Quest showcase here. We have Dragon Quest VI, Realms of Revelation is the subtitle there. What do I have to say about this one? Post-game, need to collect the remaining mini medals someday. Playtime, 43 hours, 35 minutes, level 42. I got 82 out of 100 on those mini medals. Struggling today. Voice is running thin. But, I said liking the direction of the story so far, but nothing too out of the ordinary. Doesn't seem like it's worthy of surpassing my love of five, Hand of the Heavenly Bride. Gameplay and everything else, though, is exactly what I expected out of Dragon Quest. 
great fun in one of my favorite JRPG series. Now, the one thing I don't know if I'm going to be getting into with Dragon Quest IX that I'll mention, I talked about it earlier in this particular video that the DS was the system that I continually retreated to in college. In college, I really wasn't someone who got out very often. I didn't really go out to the bars or, um, you know, get into the party scene much. I just retreated to my bunk bed on the weeknights and into the weekends and pulled up my laptop, tended to binge some anime or show on Netflix or just throw up a, you know, podcast of sorts and burn through the Dragon Quest series. So much so that I think my freshman year, sophomore year, junior and senior year, like I played a different Dragon Quest game each year. Like that was my routine at the start of every new year in college was starting a new Dragon Quest game on the DS. So um, they were great games to come to and play after a long day of classes and studying and exams and things like that. Um, just kind of turn off your brain, grind a bunch and watch an anime. Can't beat it with a Dragon Quest series. So good. So good. I'll turn this one over for you too. Get a look at some of those back of the box screenshots. The other thing I'll say too, I have uh, not finished Dragon Quest XI. I think that's probably the best jumping on point if you're looking for a Dragon Quest game to get into. I mean, otherwise I'd say five, but again, five is very pricey. The barrier to entry is a lot, but Dragon Quest XI, put about 25 to 30 hours in when that first came out on PlayStation 4, and I definitely need to get back to it. Maybe I just need to get it for Switch and play it there to kind of recreate the memories I had playing these games portably when I was in college. But next up, we have to scroll back up a little bit because we got another personal favorite of mine in Dragon Quest IX, Sentinel of the Starry Skies. What I remember distinctly about this one was just the marketing behind it. I don't think I'd ever seen a Dragon Quest game hyped this much for Western audiences. And I feel like this is kind of when the Dragon Quest series started to get some mainstream attraction. I remember advertised to heck in Nintendo Powers. I think Seth Green, I remember going to the movies one time and Seth Green was playing Dragon Quest IX in an advertisement. Like... They really went all out to get Seth Green playing Dragon Quest. But um, this is an excellent game, kind of a turning point to a certain extent when it came to um, some of the mechanics that you could, or at least the mechanics that were in it, you know, being able to create your own character, you could kind of create additional party members. It was just a lot different than kind of like what I would say the bare bones Dragon Quest experience in four through six. So really good stuff. This is one that I would love to get ported or remastered for Switch just because I know we have Dragon Quest XI, but man, I want to replay one of these earlier Dragon Quest games, and I feel like nine would be so fitting for the Switch. But anyways, what did I have to say about it? Five stars, level 50, beat the final boss, rolled in around 50 hours before I rolled credits there. Wow, here we go. Loved the level of customization in this game, especially when you found new armor and weapons and it changed the appearance of your character in-game. Felt really novel for a DS game to have that level of detail. I regret never playing this online with friends, but still had a blast playing solo. As with previous Dragon Quest entries, this was played while I was in college. Whether I played between classes or in my bunk before bed, it was always a great JRPG experience to get lost in. Mm. Couldn't agree more with my old, or I should say younger self there. And I don't know, I feel like Dragon Quest IX printed so many copies, it'd be a little bit easier to get that nowadays on DS, but never make assumptions when it comes to DS games and prices. This is probably pretty up there too, but if I had to like rank them in the order that you should try and get them, five would be at the top of my list and then nine. And then after that, I don't really have a preference between four and six necessarily, but five and nine are definitely my, my standout favorites on the DS and probably 
in, in the entire series from what I've played at this point. So, Dragon Quest IX is just good stuff. Next up, we have a game that I also, or is new, have not played this one. And that is Golden Sun Dark Dawn. So we'll add this here. And while I do, I'll tell you that I actually have no history with the Golden Sun series in terms of playing it anyways. What I do remember when it comes to the Golden Sun series, though, is that my buddy Scott, I've talked about him a number of times in my podcast because it's because him of him and his brothers that I I found and discovered so many games, whether it was the N64 or eventually the PlayStation 2. But I remember them going, they went to Game Crazy, Scott and his two brothers, and they traded in their entire NES, Super Nintendo, and N64 collection to get a Game Boy Advance SP, uh, the Link to the Past port, and Golden Sun. Can you imagine that? And when I say N64 collection, I don't mean like Super Mario 64, two controllers in a console. I mean like every conceivable game you'd want on the N64, the greatest hits, the entirety of their Super Nintendo collection, the entirety of their NES collection. And they just barely got enough trading credit to get an SP in two games. What a time to be alive, right? My goodness. But Golden Sun Dark Dawn, I've heard very mixed things about this one. More of them kind of tend to be on the side of the spectrum of mediocre, just okay. Definitely doesn't hold a candle to the first two games on the Game Boy Advance. But I'm holding out hope. Um, I'm kind of going in with no feelings or nostalgic ties to those earlier GBA games. So I think it's something that I might enjoy. But this actually got pretty cheap. This is one of the... I would say remaining RPGs on the DS that hasn't skyrocketed too much in price, at least when I bought it last year. So definitely one worth checking into. Um, but I'm looking forward to first diving deep into the first two Golden Sun games um, on the analog pocket when I get around to it. But that's Golden Sun Dark Dawn. Let's keep moving along here. We get into the Kingdom Hearts games on the DS. What could Rusty possibly think about these games? The first of which we have here, 358, over two days. I've always adored the box art to this one. And most of the Kingdom Hearts box art for that matter, but Dream Drop Distance and 358 over two days, especially because they have kind of this watercolor aesthetic to them. Fantastic stuff. And not the first time we got Kingdom Hearts portably. Of course, we have Chain of Memories on the Game Boy Advance and very fond memories playing that, even if I wasn't a very big fan of the, the, the card system. And my hype could have not been surpassed when I heard that a Kingdom Hearts game was coming to the DS. But what I thought were, were you know, great possibilities with a Kingdom Hearts game portably, you know, righting the wrongs of the, the card system and Chain of Memories... I think we also got kind of a mediocre Kingdom Hearts game in, in 358 over two days. But let's see what I had to say. I mean, the rating kind of says it all. Three stars out of five. Which is kind of interesting that it's three out of five and you have the weird subtitle for that game too. But anyways, what did Rusty have to say about this one? A bit too repetitive for me. After about 15 hours of revisiting Agrabah, I was on cruise control for the remainder of the game. I do wish we got a remaster to console similar to Dream Drop, Drop Distance though, because I think it warrants a replay at this point. And I still agree with that a thousand percent, because I played through this game once, never revisited it outside of the soundtrack, because I think some of the best music in the entirety of the Kingdom Hearts series is in 358 over two days. I also just noticed I did not put an S at the end of Kingdom Hearts kingdom heart um but yeah it just felt so repetitive i felt like you were just doing these fetch quests of sorts on loop and eventually it ended with you at the top of the clock tower 
with Shion, Roxas, and Axel eating your sea salt ice cream and those fantastic tunes would kind of kick in. But like I said, I think it warrants a remaster because we've gotten one for every other Kingdom Hearts game except this and the next one I'll talk about here shortly. And truly, I'd like to revisit this one, but I'm curious where other people are at. Like, where are my diehard Kingdom Hearts fans? How do you feel about 358 over two days? I'm just kind of meh about this one. But like I said, I would like to revisit it because it's been years. It's been years since I've played it. So. I mean, you can't complain about portable Kingdom Hearts, right? In whatever form or fashion we get it. Right? Well, maybe we can with this next one. Speaking of weird, Kingdom Hearts Recoded. Cool boxer in this one too. It, I don't know if you can tell from the video footage here, but very glossy, kind of a shiny foil cover. And uh, you of course got our boys Donald and the Goof back for this one, which speaking of being frustrated, like come on. I was so frustrated for the for the number of t Kingdom Hearts games we got where we were not, one, playing as Sora, or two, even if we were, we didn't have my pals Donald and Goofy with me along for the adventure, but Recoded is a strange one. As far as I know, this is basically a port of a mobile-only game that came out in Japan. There are some very bizarre mechanics in this game that just don't amount to anything memorable i'll say when it comes to kingdom hearts at least not in a positive way more so like you kind of scratch your head and think why did they do that but let's see what i had to say about this one kingdom hearts recoded three out of five stars what a strange game this was i said i guess it kind of makes sense that this game was originally released as a mobile only game and eventually made its way to ds there are so many experimentally strange mechanics thrown into the pot with mixed success. There was literally a space harrier like section where you're vertically scroll shooting as Sora. It's true, it, it was weird. There's another section too where there's like turn based battles, which we've obviously never seen in Kingdom Hearts to this point. Lastly, I said Nomura and Kojima need to make a game together. Can you imagine how bonkers that would be? I mean, the story itself would be nonsensical craziness, but I would just want to know what the title of a game developed by Nomura and Kojima would be. Gosh, can't make that kind of stuff up. Although you probably could. You find some like video game title generator on YouTube or on the internet, I mean, you'd probably land close to what a Kojima Nomura game would be titled. But yeah, very bizarre game. Uh, this is another one, too, as part of the Kingdom Hearts remasters over the years that we did not get a a remaster of the game itself. We just got a remaster of all of the cutscenes in the game, which I did not mention for 358 over two days, but we did get those remastered cutscenes, just not the game. So, eh, it kind of is what it is. But I'd love to see 358 over two days remastered far and above Recoded. Recoded is not a game I need to play again. Next up, we have a game that I bought for my wife a couple years back because can you really resist the charm of Nintendogs on the DS? Just an essential game for the collection, I feel like. If nothing more, for the novelty of it, um, you couldn't get away from the advertisements of this game back in the day, whether it was Nintendo Power, other gaming mag magazines, or just in pop culture in general. Like It was just celebrities were playing this game playing with your little dogs, using your, your touch screen on the DS. It's been years since I've played this. I originally had a copy myself, um, since gotten rid of it, but then had to get a copy for my wife. I guess we'll just probably put like 10 dogs, abs and friends. And I'm probably gonna null this one. Can you beat Nintendo dogs? I mean, first of all, clarification, do not beat your dogs. That is wrong and inhumane. But can you finish Nintendogs, like the game? Definitely important to clarify there. Words are important. 
words are important. And so are dogs. I didn't mention at the top, but we got Scooby in the background. He's chilling with me tonight. Yeah, novel concept, and I love that you I think they are at least three Nintendogs games. Yeah, you got Chihuahuas, and then you got like Labradors and Friends, or Dachshunds, maybe. Yeah. Such a cool game for the time. All right, continue to move along here. Next up, we have arguably my favorite puzzle game of all time, Hit Cross 3D. Now, if you follow my podcast, my YouTube videos over the years, I'm not someone who really likes puzzles and games. Even the environmental puzzles and stuff like Tomb Raider and Uncharted, they're just not really for me. But my goodness, I'd be lying if I told you that I didn't completely fall in love with Pit Cross 3D. I remember going into Best Buy very vividly, picking this game up for 20 bucks. And if you've never played Pit Cross, you kind of, at least in this one, have a 3D grid of cubes. Each of the cubes has a number, and that kind of tells you basically how many times you need to click on that particular block, and eventually you pick away enough to reveal some type of inanimate object, animal, some other random thing. And this is a game that I retreated to quite a bit during my college years because it's one of those things you could pick up for 5, 10, 15 minutes, knock out a few puzzles, very satisfying, and put it back down again. I hope that this is not a game that's gone up in price. If it is, what a shame. If it's not, definitely pick it up for all you puzzle fans out there. Can't speak highly enough of Pit Cross. And that's coming from someone that doesn't even like puzzles. And I guess we kind of shied away from my backloggery thoughts here. Kind of reiterating what I already said. Not even a big fan of puzzles, but I couldn't put this game down. Still a game I come back to frequently. Just good stuff. Next up, we have a pretty unique title, and we're kind of getting into the uh, long list and pile of Pokemon games that I have for the Nintendo DS. Here we have Pokemon Conquest. What a wild amalgamation of what is it, Nobunaga's ambition and Pokemon. If you've never heard of Pokemon Conquest, if you've never seen gameplay, think Final Fantasy Tactics. Fire Emblem of sorts, throw a Pokemon skin over it, and you have Pokemon Conquest. Never in a million years did I think something like that would be fun, nor is it something I think anyone would have, but it works surprisingly well. I had such a great time playing this game in college when it first came out, played it to completion, really enjoyed it, and I was floored to see the price it's going for nowadays. This is one I almost parted with just because it's not one that I felt a need to really go back to or desire to. Um, I, I'm glad I kind of held on to it just because if I ever wanted to replay it, I would have had to pay an arm and a leg for it, as do people today, if you're still trying to add this one to the collection. But I think what's maybe most surprising about this game, because I think it works so well, I don't know how well it sold, but I'm surprised we haven't seen a sequel to Pokemon Conquest. I think it would be really fitting and at home on the Nintendo Switch, but I don't know. This this might just be a one-time thing for the Pokemon series. And even if it is, um, I think it'll kind of go down as a, a great kind of one-hit wonder when it comes to Pokemon spinoffs so again if you can magically come across a copy of pokemon conquest in the wild and snag a copy for cheap or you know get your ebay alerts up and try and catch someone slipping and get one for relatively inexpensive i do think it's worth it i can't comfortably recommend anyone pay a hundred plus dollars though for pokemon conquest i don't i don't think it's that fun it is good though 
And what I said on Backloggery is Final Fantasy Tactics Pokemon works a lot better than I thought it would. Would love to see another entry in the future. And I completely agree to this day. Four out of five stars. Next up, we kind of get into the mainline series of Pokemon games, starting with Pokemon Black version. I gotta be completely honest, this era of Pokemon games, or this generation, both Black and White and Black and White 2, I don't remember a darn thing about these generations. Um, probably just because this is about that time when I was really just getting fatigued or just, was just getting Pokemon fatigue when it came to the series. Absolutely love, and to this day is probably my second favorite generation in, um, not Diamond and Pearl, Ruby and Sapphire. And then Diamond, Pearl, Platinum was, you know, kind of, we'll get to Platinum here in a second, but Black and White, Black and White 2, just did not really enjoy these ones as much. But Pokemon's Pokemon, again, these games were great to play in college because group experience share was not a thing. So it was another game like the Dragon Quest games to hop in my bunk at night, grind away, listen to a podcast, play between classes, and still get my Pokemon fix. So I did like my boy Tapeg over here, that starter, it's my dude, really good stuff. But the games themselves, dang. Black and White and Black and White 2 were a grind. And in my comment, I said grinding for the Elite Four. Gym badges 8, Pokedex 98, time played just under 40 hours. So um, I, I said this one's beat, but again, I haven't turned that particular copy on in forever. So tough to say if I actually ever rolled, rolled credits on that one or not. Maybe I'm lying. But speaking of Pokemon White 2, there she is. Pokemon White version 2. I don't have both Black and White or Black and White 2. I just have copies of Black and White 2. And I gotta be honest, I don't even know what they did for the sequels. I do love that cover art though. It's really slick. Because you still have the same starters. So I'm not sure if this was just a case of like an emerald or a platinum or a crystal where a couple different Pokemon added some little subtle things in between games, but it wasn't like a completely new region. I doubt that it was because you have the same starters, but again, nothing more to add here. It's more Pokemon. Didn't do a lot for me, at least that particular generation, but um, it's more Pokemon. And with that, I said Elite Four beaten. Now it's time to catch more Pokemans. Time played, dang, nearly 70 hours on that one. I saw 408 Pokemon and I caught 167. I'm actually surprised. Especially when I cannot really recall playing either that or Pokemon Black. When I had basically 100 hours between the two games. Interesting stuff. Now next up, we do get to a particular Pokemon game that is very special to me. And that is Pokemon Platinum. I won't go into the details of it, but was going through a lot in my personal life when this game came out and I bought it and I was playing it on that red DS Lite and really just got me through some very, very difficult times, depression, just battling some other personal demons. But um, man, that's what video games are so great for, right? Whether you're going through really tough times or you're celebrating great times, video games, without a doubt, are always still a great place to retreat to and kind of turn off your brain and enjoy a great experience. But what did I have to say about Pokemon Platinum version? 96 hours, 25 minutes. That is to this day the longest amount of time I've played a singular Pokemon game. 411 Pokemon caught almost a complete Pokedex and I beat the Elite Four five times. I don't care if it's red or blue, silver or gold, I've never done that for any Pokemon game ever. I said, this game got me through some really challenging and depressing times when I was in high school. When I felt down, my DS was on, and I was retreating to the Sinnoh region and probably listening to all-gen gamers, TV and lust, or radio-free Nintendo podcasts. 
would like to complete the Pokedex on this Sunday. That's funny. Those are probably like the top three most listened to podcasts of that era for me, high school, early college. Um, and I still go back and listen to a lot of those episodes nowadays just to kind of get that kind of nostalgic feel. But also, again, those shows are a product of their time because they were talking about the Wii and the 360 and the PS3 and the DS and the PSP and you just can't beat it, right? Especially when you're, uh, you know, kind of revisiting some of your favorite games that you played during that time. But Pokemon Platinum got me through some special or especially difficult times and as I tend to favor the fire starters, Chimchar, also my dude. Hiplip's pretty cool too though. Next up, we have a duo of games. The first of which is Pokemon Soul Silver version. Oh my gosh. Fantastic remakes of the Game Boy Color games of the same name, Silver and Gold. Oddly enough, I was so late to the party when Silver and Gold came out that I ended up kind of inheriting my friend's copy of Pokemon Crystal, and I don't even think I ever beat the game uh, growing up as a kid. So playing Soul Silver was really my definitive experience playing through that region and experiencing that, you know, generation of Pokemon. And it, it sounds so bizarre and almost like a lie to say this, but like I didn't know when I played the DS game that once you beat the eight gym badges and got to the Elite Four, you basically unlock the Kanto region and then get to go through that first generation of gyms again. That was a completely new thing to me. So doing that for the first time, pretty special. And uh, I have not done the same for Heart Gold. So I imagine I'll start a new file in Heart Gold someday and just revisit it. And this is like one of the very few generations where I had to go with the water starter because for alligator, come the heck on. My boy Totodile, so damn cute. Um, and Soul Silver is actually the only one that I have the the box for, in addition to the Pokey Walker. Heart Gold, I do not. I only have the case manual game, which is fine. There's no way in heck I'm ever going to pay the, the prices that these are going for on eBay to complete my copy of Heart Gold. It's just insane, insane how pricey these Pokemon games have gotten, but... I will add Heart Gold because that is a more recent addition in the past couple of years just to complete the set. And what I'd love for them to do, I've been saying this for the past couple of years, ever since we got Pokemon Eevee and Pikachu Let's Go, I would love if they did Johto Let's Go. That was such a nostalgic trip for me playing Let's Go, one of the first games I bought on my Switch, and because I was a late adopter to the Nintendo Switch, and catching those Pokemon, leveraging the kind of gyro mechanics of the Pokemon Go mobile game on the Switch was such a treat. Revisiting Kanto was a nostalgic delight, and doing that for Johto and kind of giving it that Let's Go treatment, I feel like, one, would sell like nobody's business, Nintendo and Game Freak, like let's be honest. But, man, revisiting that in the Let's Go fashion would be fantastic. So, holding out hope for that someday. But that rounds out all of the Pokemon games. Now we kind of get into more puzzle games. And can you believe it? Rusty actually enjoyed them. Starting with Professor Layton and the Curious, Curious Village. Like I said, not a big fan of puzzles. These games built from the ground up, solving puzzles, but it was the story that kept me invested beginning to end. I just loved kind of going on these adventures with Layton and seeing these stories to conclusion, especially when we get to the third in this trilogy of games on the DS. Excellent stuff and 
games that I think I'd want to revisit today because I've only played each game that I have in my collection once and that's it and talk about great music the latent soundtracks are phenomenal phenomenal and kind of surprising that we haven't seen a latent game on the switch at least not to my knowledge um but I feel like these games could really benefit either from like a remastered trilogy get the first three latent games on switch or um again a game built from the ground up for the switch in the latent series i think would be so good and might be a little bit difficult you know not using a stylus to solve the puzzles that might be a little bit weird so they might have to kind of build these from the ground up for a switch game but nonetheless the professor latent games are terrific what did i have to say about the curious village four to five stars all chapters completed in about 13 hours, 120, I had 120 puzzles solved. Oh, can you believe it? I use a guide a lot for these games because, well, puzzles are not really my thing. I love me some late music and the story is so fun. Still stands true today. Next up, second game in the series, Professor Layton and the Diabolical Box. Not my favorite in the series, but it continues the story. And um, of course the puzzle solving mechanics of the first game. Three out of five stars for this one. All chapters completed in about 12 hours, all puzzles solved. And I had 123 hint coins left over. This one I said, probably my least favorite latent game, but that's not saying much. It's still a must play for fans of the series. Stay true, stays true to its puzzle solving craziness and still retains some of the best cutscenes in the music and music the DS has to offer. The final few hours really pick up too. Excellent game. And that's the thing. I don't even really remember the stories of these games. I just remember really being wowed by the third one. But I've been kind of encouraging my wife to play and so I can kind of live vicariously through her because one, she loves puzzle games and I just think that she'd have such a trip playing these three uh, latent games. It's also worth saying that I don't have Last Spectre, which I think is also a DS game or Miracle Mask on 3DS or the crossover between Professor, or not Professor Layton, um, Ace Attorney. I always wanted to get Last Spectre, but I think I held off for too long. That's one that I think has gone up in price pretty significantly. And the reason why I wanted it outside of just continuing the story of these characters is the, it was almost two games in one, if I'm not mistaken. And you have the normal Layton campaign, and then you also had this other section of the game completely separate from the Layton campaign, where it was almost Earthbound-like, where you're kind of wandering around this town, bird's eye view, kind of RPG like, I think still solving puzzles. I'm not entirely sure, but I just remember reading and seeing gameplay footage of that and thinking to myself, I need that. And I was holding out hope for it to come down in price and it's done anything, but it's just gone up. So maybe someday, but my personal favorite, the third and final in the quote unquote, Professor Layton and the the Professor Layton Trilogy, and that is The Unwound Future. I adored this game. I don't know what else to say, but let's see what I had to write about it back then. Layton and The Unwound Future. All puzzles solved in about 15 hours. Exceptional music. Fantastic story. I was really digging the puzzles in this one. Layton at his finest. Again, couldn't agree more. Fantastic stuff. And I'm probably going to speak out of turn here, but I feel like the print runs on these first three Layton games were pretty substantial that getting this trilogy would be moderately priced, but I could be wrong. It'd be a shame if this one, if this trilogy kind of breaks the bank, because again, I feel like these are essential to anyone's DS library. Again, even if you're not a big fan of puzzles because I'm not and I still had such a great time going through those. 
Now we get into five games that are relatively new to kind of round out my collection here. And some of which I played, some of which I haven't. But before I get into those, I do want to mention, like I did at the top, that these are what I would consider the greatest hits for my personal collection. There's a lot of games here that I've loved over the years that I've kind of parted ways with. You know, two that come to mind are WarioWare Touched, um, a near launch game for the DS. I never really played any of the games in the Wario series or WarioWare series to this point and love that game. But that was another game that I just felt like I, I'm okay to live without this one. So I've since parted ways with that. Another highlight for me that I actually kind of do wish I still owned is Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars. I was not over the moon or as in love with Grand Theft Auto 4 as the rest of the world was. Just was not very enamored with Nico Bellic and, and his story and just the world of GTA 4. But my goodness, did I still have a heck of a fun time playing a Grand Theft Auto game in that era. It was just on the DS and it was called Chinatown Wars. They leveraged the DS capabilities so well in that game, told an interesting story, and it was just a riot to play. So good. And that's another one that has unfortunately gone up quite a bit in price. I was actually looking last night before, um, you know, kind of getting ready for, for this recording. And it's like 50, 60 plus bucks to get, which is just a shame. But um, I would even say if you can get it for like 40, 50, still worth it. Still worth it. Really good game. Uh, but those are two that stand out to me. I'm sure there's others that I'm not thinking about, but this is what I would consider the greatest hits for me, but that does not mean in any way that I'm not willing to go out and search for more DS games out there. So if you have any recommendations, drop a comment below. I'd love to hear them. Let's get back into my collection. This one may be a little surprising to people. Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Now, I originally played this game on the Game Boy Advance. My friend had a copy. And it was not too long after that. Um, probably just do that. Yeah, we'll do it that way. When I got my Nintendo DS from my buddy Donald, and whenever like bad things were happening in my my personal life back then, especially when I was at my mom's house, she would tend to take me and my sister again to Hollywood Video, Blockbuster, GameStop, or some neighboring retail store and allow us to get something to kind of make peace with the difficult times we were going through. Even if it was just renting a game and getting some candy at the counter. Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, was one of those instances. I remember distinctly us going to a Best Buy, or maybe it was even Media Play back then. And I'd already played the Game Boy Advance game at my friend's house. We're kind of riding the, 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 the wave of hype surrounding Episode 3 when it had come out back in 2005, I believe. And so I ended up picking up the DS copy. Or at least my mom bought it for me surprisingly really fun side-scrolling beat-em-up kind of hack and slash type of game where you play as obi-wan and anakin through a variety of missions detailing and kind of going through the major events of the film also interesting because as you finish the level you accumulate a bunch of experience points and you allocate that to a variety of attributes and stats as you probably wouldn't expect in kind of rpg fashion for a Star Wars game based on a movie. So it's a game that anytime I can recommend to folks, I do, especially when it comes to licensed games, because it's, as far as I know, super cheap, pretty short game, but uh, a memorable one at that. And even if you're not a fan of Star Wars, definitely recommend picking this one up. I would think the DS one is the definitive way to go, but again, you can get it on the GBA as well. Surprising hidden gem, if you will. And uh, speaking of hidden gems, Pixar's Wally. -E. So, two funny things to note here. One, I haven't played this game. Two, I haven't seen the movie either for Wally. -E. I remember going to some high school event where they were showing this movie, and I fell asleep. 
even though I think it's the first Pixar movie to ever get a Criterion release because it's held in that high regard. Let's give you a hair in the frame. But yeah, I, I've never really seen the movie beginning to end. I don't even really have much of a desire to. But that game was gifted to me by a friend during a Christmas gift exchange that I do on an annual basis with my good friends. Uh, they record the Tarkaron show here on YouTube, T-A-R-Q-A-R-O-N. Definitely go check them out. But my buddy Zach, he gifted that to me because we're both kind of suckers for licensed games, especially uh, ones that are kind of a Disney Pixar type of property. So haven't played this one. I'm sure I'll get around to it someday. But Pixar's Wally, -E. interesting stuff there. Next up, we have a game that I also have not played. Added it to the collection late last year. That is The Legend of Spyro, Dawn of the Dragon. I had to double take on the subtitle there. Huge fan of the earlier Spyro games. You know, the first three on the PlayStation 1. I really haven't gotten around to playing any of the spinoffs that were not developed by Insomniac. Of course, Insomniac developed the games during that PS1 era. And then after that, um, Activision kind of took over and continued to pump them out on the PS2 GameCube era, but I never really got around to playing any of them. And I've heard they're kind of just okay most of the time. There's not that many standout titles that I think could probably compete with that original trilogy, but this one, my wife and I, we were traveling in Pittsburgh late last fall to go and see the Pittsburgh Steelers. And we, of course, made our rounds to a number of game shops in Pittsburgh. And I, I saw that game for like, I don't know, less than 10 bucks. And I thought, might as well go for it. Love me some Spyro. This one seems to look like it has some kind of isometric mechanics, maybe some side-scrolling platforming as well, but still kind of staying true to its platforming roots, just with a different developer. So looking forward to getting around to playing that someday. Next up, we have a game that I picked up based on the, not even recommendation, but one of my good buddies mentioned him earlier in the video, Blink. He had picked this up and it just sounded so interesting and so of the era, right? Where you have these ideas that seem ludicrous that they would never do nowadays. I don't think many developers would get the funding to do something like this, but Treasure World. This is a game where you basically go out and wander around the streets, cities, wherever, like literally, like you physically have to take your DS places, turn on the Wi-Fi, and every time your DS picks up a Wi-Fi signal within whatever distance or radius of you, you unlock items in the game. So anytime you are within distance of a Wi-Fi signal you unlock in-game items to outfit your character and kind of outfit this little hub area. That's it. That's the game. It's Treasure World. If you like collecting things, this is like the definitive collecting game for the Nintendo DS. Now where things get a little interesting with this is I don't know with eShops closing and things like that if you can even still play this game. I would think you can because you should be able to go into the network settings and turn on your Wi-Fi and connect to other Wi-Fi signals. But regardless, just such an inventive, unique game for the time. Actually reviewed pretty well, but if this sounds like something you're interested in, I'd first confirm that it's still playable and then go to eBay immediately because I bought this game sealed for eight bucks. And before I hopped on to record this, I checked and you can still get sealed copies for 10 bucks. So Treasure World, I think they probably um, printed too many copies. Not enough people bought it. And obviously it's not in high demand today. So check out Treasure World. Definitely a very original game for the Nintendo DS. And then lastly here, we have a game that I'm not going to add to the collection I didn't add Treasure World either, but I'll add it after the recording. The Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass. I had someone actually pick this up and gift it to me when they were in Japan. 
because I think the cover art for Phantom Hourglass on the DS, the Japan version, is so much better than the copy we got in North America. I've actually never played Phantom Hourglass. I've only played Spirit Tracks, which I liked quite a bit. But I think in a similar way that Spirit Tracks irritated me with navigation and constantly going from one area to the next on that train, I think Phantom Hourglass kind of suffers from the same shortcomings of Wind Waker with traveling in the boat. I can't say from experience. These are just things that I've heard. So please get at me in the comments. Is Phantom Hourglass still worth playing today? I'd love to hear because I personally never got around to playing it. But um, Spirit Tracks anyways had fantastic dungeon design and I love the boss battles. Pretty good music as well. So if Phantom Hourglass is more of the same, I'll have to check it out. But that's it, folks. We have finished and rounded out the DS collection updates as part of this new game collection update series here that I'm doing on YouTube. So hopefully you found this interesting. Maybe you found a couple of unique DS game recommendations. You know, I'm thinking of things like Treasure World or even Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith. And of course, the Dragon Quest series if you can stomach the cost for those nowadays. But let me know, please, in the comment section below, what did you think about this video? Did you like the new format where you can actually see the games? I got some great feedback in the last episode that, hey, it's kind of difficult to know which game you're talking about at times if I my attention is drawn elsewhere. So um, I thought that was a great way to, one, see the physical game, but also if you're you know browsing eBay or playing a game while you're watching this, you can always look back at the screen and rec recognize and know what game I'm talking about, but get in the comment section. Let me know what some of your favorite DS games are. Tell me some of the earliest memories you have playing the DS when you got it. And once again, if you have any recommendations for me, let me know. I'd love to add them to my wish list and kind of uh, go out into the wild on eBay and see if I can get them for relatively uh, inexpensive. But I want to thank everyone for tuning into this video. I really appreciate it. And stay tuned because we're going to be doing more consoles going forward, continuing to update them here in Backloggery and tell fun stories and hopefully you get some fun recommendations along the way. Be sure to follow me on Twitter because that's probably where I'm going to post a poll to figure out where we want to go with this moving forward in terms of which consoles I showcase. And then I'll also have some links in the show notes below for the podcast that I record. You can find me over there as well. But take care, everyone. Keep playing those great video games. Stay safe. Stay healthy out there. We'll see you in the next video.